Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Howard Koh. I'm very pleased to welcome you to a new video series entitled What CEOs Say, co-sponsored by the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Business School with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Our overall goal is to explore how the private sector can leverage its resources to promote health and well-being for society. And in particular, we want to meet business leaders who have committed to promoting a culture that advances health for employees, consumers, communities, and or the environment. We want to hear from leaders about how they made that commitment, what changes they've made, the challenges they faced and how they overcame them, and the lessons learned that they want to share with others. Thank you for joining us. Mary, how are you? Sheena, good. Mary Powell, <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. Oh. Uh, Mary is the president and CEO of Green Mountain Power. And Mary, I have to say that I always describe you as an enigma. In, in the you. utility <laughs> world, which is a, That's a compliment, it, actually. exactly, <laughs> which is the first thing I wanted to tell you. But one one of the reasons I want you to be here is I would like somebody throughout this school to figure out how to clone Mary Powell. Ah, uh, but you. I only say that jokingly for anyone out there t taking this seriously. You know, you have been a, um, a, a role model for a lot of of people, in, including young women. And I thought it would be great to start this conversation just by giving you a chance to sort of tell your story about how you got from a, a, a pretty um, modest um, growing up in New York mm -hmm. to hang out in Vermont and do what you do, because it's not normal to see a utility executive, and it's clearly not normal to see one that is, is both a woman but uh, so sensitive to broader issues and social mm -hmm. issues and and you've done a remarkable job. So could you just give people a sense of where you sure. came from and how you got there? Oh, how long do we have, Gina? <laughs> I will give you about a minute and a half. No, okay, no. no. Long, as long as you need, Mary, because oh, it's, it's awesome an inspiration. Oh, it's awesome to be here. It really is. And, um, and it's humbling to be an inspiration, and it's important to be an inspiration. I think we all we need that. I've had a lot of those in my life. You've been one of them. So it's really an honor to sit with you and to talk about this and to have this conversation. Um, yeah, I, I would say I absolutely am an outlier, I, without a shadow of a doubt. I've called myself for years the accidental executive, because not only did I never see myself doing the kind of work I'm doing, but I never wanted to do the kind of work that I'm doing. Um, I grew up uh, in New York City, a uh, child of a, of a working New York actor, which meant that um, he wasn't working a lot, so we knew a lot about uh, financial scarcity uh, when I was growing up, and I learned a lot about uh, being passionate about what you're doing and being willing to sacrifice for the passion uh, that you have. Um, so really, I, I grew up with an orientation that people that were doing the work that I've gotten to do, um, I kind of felt sorry for them. I actually didn't, I didn't see real meaning behind the work that people were doing uh, in business. So it is, it, it's being an outlier though, being a woman, being an outlier, being an artist, I'm not, I think, yes, I was one of the only CEO women of investor-owned utilities in the country when I became CEO, but I surely was the only person who was not, I think, an engineer or a lawyer either in the role. So being an outlier, Gina, has given me, I think, incredible freedom to be a really values-based leader. And that's what I like to think that I've brought to the role. That's what has has uh, given such personal meaning to me in the work that I've done. It's that I've been able to uh, really lean into being an outlier and really just lead on a values-based approach. Well, Mary, it, 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 part of, I think, the, the joy of being with you is that you lack any pretense. Do you know what I mean? You're just a very honest and straightforward person. And I loved, um, reading in your bio the fact that you were so surprised to like business classes yeah. <laughs> you know why this. would anyone like business exactly. classes and, exactly and and then you, and one of your quotes were the next worst thing <laughs> to banking and government is to work for a utility. Yes. I actually put utilities <laughs> below government. I just want to make that very clear. Um, but, but clearly, um, 
Chris Dutton, who you worked for when mm -hmm. you first uh, went to the company, uh, saw something in you uh, that made him realize that the person running his HR office would be a good person to run the company. Mm. What did he see? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so Gene, I, I have said all those things because, again, I, you know, back to the building I grew up in New York City, um, you know, there was a very successful lawyer. The way buildings worked in New York, probably still now, but then was sort of the higher up the floor went, the more status you had. We were on a low floor in the building, and Mr. Hart was on the top floor of the building and was very successful. And I would see him coming and going at the very, very late hours and very, very early. And I used to just feel, I felt bad for him. I thought, what a life, you know? <laughs> he has to get dressed up every day and be stuck inside. And so, yeah, I didn't, it wasn't what I, what I, I went to do. And so it was part of why when I went to Green Mountain Power, as much as I loved Chris Dutton and I, he was such an approachable, uh, down-to-earth guy. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a very formal environment, and everybody was, uh, you know, it was very, it was full of what I viewed as bureaucracy and layers and formality that didn't need to be there. And so it's why I said no to the job, not once, not twice, but actually three times before I actually <laughs> went there. And actually, a, a, a wonderful woman that I used to chat with who wasn't in business at all uh, was the reason I ultimately said yes, because she said, Mary, I just, I think there's a reason this keeps coming up. She said, I think you ought to just go there and find out if there's a reason you're supposed to be there. And so I think Chris must have seen that reason. I think he, he saw the um, drive in me, the uh, values-based way that, that I approached the work that I was doing. Yeah. Um, and the company was in a world of hurt right after I joined. Yeah. So I really ended up being the catalyst of a complete and absolute transformation of the company, of the culture of the company, to really become the unutility, to really change from, you know, when I interviewed there, Gina, it was, it was called the Glass Palace, where they worked. It was a big glass building. It looked like it was a, a you know, a huge campus, corporate campus. I mean, this is in Vermont. It, it felt out of place. And I went in, and it was a big stone lobby, and you had to go up stone stairs to get into the CEO's office. Nice and warm, and friendly, nice right? and, warm and, yeah, friendly. Right. and then you had to get through not one, but two private secretaries to get into his office that was like just secure away from any customers. Did you add or any... another secretary when you took over? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, five. Yeah, yeah five. Three, yeah, yeah. <laughs> three at least. Yeah. So it was just so now you come into where I work and it's like a colorful open space where I work at a table. I actually don't even have a stand up desk anymore. I work at a table alongside three other people with the line men, the line department right here and other field folks right here. Do you have to here. get dressed up? God, no. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll, I'll take that So we got, there. in fact, I'll never forget that conversation with Chris. I, <laughs> I remember, because I was dressed up when I started, because they all were dressed up. And I remember I went into his office and I said, like, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, like, are you dressed up for me? <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm all dressed up. I'm wearing stocking, and like, and you're all dressed up. and." you're kind of just hidden away all day. And I don't get, when I get out, I'm out with customers and employees and they're not dressed up. So why are we dressing up? <laughs> so actually one of the first things we did, and it was, you know, it was a big change actually for the culture yeah. was like, stop that. Like, like we're not gonna do that. We're gonna dress in a more informal, approachable way. And in fact, no, it freaked everybody out because I actually said, and we're not doing like, a dress code of what business casual is. We're leaving it to like people they, to decide themselves. They can wear whatever they want. <laughs> it's up to them. So, so that actually, it's funny, was one of the first lot conversations. Of we, I mean, it is yeah, absolutely. Lot of yeah, absolutely. It absolutely is. Any reflective sort of kind of stuff. Not, not as much as I'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. Um, you know, the, you're sort of getting to, to one of the issues that I think is, is most fascinating. And, and one of the things I think we should talk about a lot, and it fascinates me because my undergraduate degree was in cultural anthropology. Mm. Culture matters to me. Yes. Mary, you bring a different culture, 
uh, to, to where you work mm -hmm. and, and how you think about it. And I know your motto was uh, being fast, fun, effective, and customer obsessed. Mm -hmm. I've never heard a CEO say fun. <laughs> All the rest, fine, but not fun. Oh, you gotta fun. have fun. You have and, to have and fun. I, I mean, I, I just think you brought a, a, a level of being down to earth that probably mm -hmm. was very welcome in Vermont. Mm -hmm. But you also, when I'm reading back, you you just, I saw a different person um, thinking about culture than I usually see in a company, and especially in a utility that tends to be very standoffish. Mm -hmm. They act as if they're just technical providers mm -hmm. of of a need mm -hmm. without understanding as much who they was who they're servicing and what their needs are. And so I wanted to draw you out a little bit because w what Chris said when he actually asked you and successfully for the third time asked you and you stayed. He said he came to recognize your discipline, your understanding of how organizations work and how people behave, for better or ill, and how effectively you can influence those behavior patterns. Mm -hmm. You are all about people's behavior, and, 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 and you did two things. You first, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, focused on internal culture. Mm -hmm. Then you, in order to get the ship righted, mm -hmm. if you will, and then outside mm -hmm. culture. And I'd like to explore both those, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure. Tell me what you did inside. What did you do different other than dress codes? I love people. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that at the end of the day, you know, what I brought to the organization was a love of people. I love people. And I believe that people can do amazing things when they're unleashed and they're loved and appreciated and you create some kind of emotional connectivity. And so our customer obsession is also an extension of the same thing, you know. And yes, it was about, it was the fast, fun, and effective was about like how do we completely pivot this as as much as we can the and as starkly as we can? Well no, no, it was not doing well at all. In fact, they thought it was doing very well when they finally convinced me to join. And then I went on a family vacation for a couple of weeks to get adjusted to like joining this company. And while I was gone, the company got handed a rate order that basically put it on the verge of bankruptcy. So that also became, you know, don't waste a good crisis, right? So yeah. I did not. So that really became the platform yeah. that I could also tr try to drive this massive systemic change. And I really do believe culture eats strategy. I'm, I'm not one for, for breakfast, lunch, lunch and, and dinner. dinner. Right, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I've never been one, you know, yeah. when organizations spend endless resources and time and everybody gets interviewed and then they create this massive document. Who cares? Like, it, it, like know <laughs> where you want to go, know where you need to go, know what your values are. You know, yes, you have to have a direction. But at the end of the day, if you build this culture of high-performing, deeply connected individuals who are connected to the cause for which they exist, which for us was serving Vermonters mm -hmm. and creating a cleaner, greener future, by the way, at the same time, you know, when you do that, you know, it, that is the power that drives the big systemic changes. That's the power that drew, drew like, going from maybe 50 percent customer satisfaction to now we're at 94 percent, Gina. So it was yeah. it was really about infusing the organization with those that that North Star um, and really I think bringing that love of people and high performance, you know, because again, love of people doesn't mean that you don't bring tough love. Actually, tough love is a huge part of loving people. Um, yeah. It's a huge yeah. part of creating the kind of culture change that was needed, um, where if there, if there wasn't the fit, if, it, you know, if, if people couldn't operate in that kind of customer-obsessed, service-oriented, fast, fun, and effective you know, kind of organizational mechanism, you needed to help them find their way to some place else where they could be successful. Yeah, but I, I think we, we share, I think, I'm sure some of the love for people, but you know, running a company I isn't easy. Um, mm -hmm. You have, but one of the things that I, I found a little, really fascinating by it, is you did spend a lot of time initially internally trying to figure out how to deal with 
the, the challenge you didn't expect to face, how to focus. Mm -hmm. um, you clearly stated a mission, mm -hmm. and you clearly made that mission broader than just with producing energy. Right. You know, yep. and, and you th thought about that. But even internally, you learned lessons about organization and applied those somewhere mm -hmm. along the line. Mm -hmm. Because the, the people started to talk about it as, as the, when they lived in that glass house mm -hmm. with a guy before you, they were about punching a clock. Mm -hmm. And you transformed that to actually mm -hmm. make them responsible mm -hmm. for the mission. Yeah. and for their own performance. And they felt better. Yep. They actually felt like they were contributing. Right. That's not, uh, 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 that is not just happenstance. Mm -hmm. You planned that. Mm -hmm. you, and you Absolutely. look at how to redesign and reorganize, you built that into the system. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I, and, and my approach to this work is to give Chris Dutton his due, incredibly disciplined. Um, and, yeah. you know, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about leadership, actually, and I think a lot of people sort of see leadership as this reward that happens because you work so hard. And I actually see it inversely, like it becomes this, tr like you have to work harder than you've ever worked in your life to do it well. Um, and it requires incredible discipline to be uh, to be a leader of a successful organization and a successful team because you can't be complacent for one second in your investment in the people that you're working with, in your investment in the kind of discipline it takes yeah. around communication, around uh, continuing that forward momentum. But initially the sort of how, we, how I deconstructed the culture was really like um, I mean, you know, if you ever read Dilbert cartoons, it was like about <laughs> de-Dilberting the whole place. <laughs> like it was, it was really about like eliminating silos and bureaucracies and, and your classic of, I do also believe, believe in lean organizations. Yeah. I really do. Like I believe that we perform our best work when the plate is a little overflowing like people do. So it's not just that connection to the mission, but it's that connection that comes when you know you're important. Like you know, because you have a lot of things on your plate and you don't have time for meetings about emails or, you know, the, so, so again, it's, it was really having a very lean organization with delayered, uh, you know, significantly delayered. Yeah. So there's just not a lot that, that, uh, that so goes on between. So people knew what was on their plate and right. what they were and, responsible for. And there's a for. constant connectivity yeah. between, yeah, yeah. you know, the front line of the organization and the entire organization. And so, you know, one example of that is we start Monday morning every single week the exact same way. 7 a.m., we all start with a company-wide conference call. Company-wide open line, usually anywhere, we have about 500 and some of us, uh, you know, usually at least 400 are dialed in. It's Green not, Mountain Coffee. Green Mountain Power. Co Green Mountain Coffee. Coffee powers the, yes. Yeah, it's powers 7, 7 a.m. Yes, have oh yes, now. yes. Oh, we have coffee. Oh, we have coffee. We have that coffee. That is the and fuel for human beings. Absolutely, well, and part of the change yeah. we made to a healthier organization was we not just, we do have coffee and we have fruit and we have yogurt and we have all sorts of things for Fabulous. people in the Good. morning. Okay, then now I but can But we take start the every, every week, you know, in uh, the same way, which is we talk about, we talk about safety, which is huge. Um, you can't love people in this business and not care a lot about their safety. So we yeah. hit that and we talk about big picture things going on. We talk about projects being worked. This week we talked about a project in you know, East Jamaica, uh, Vermont. And, uh, you know, and then we also talk about our measurements. So back to discipline, mm -hmm. we also measure like, I think there's 78 things we measure every single week. And we send it out to all employees every single week. So everybody sees how the call center did, how production did, all these metrics. And we hit it every single week that we talk about that. So it's this combination of love, uh, creative chaos, and incredible discipline around North yeah. Star and around what we measure and what we talk about. Well, you, you measure internal and external performance, yes. right? Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the, uh, you know, you're talking about having a full plate. Mary, I don't see you as the t kind of person who empties their plate ever, mm -mm. Right? right? And so part of what, what fascinated me was your constant transitioning of, of the, 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 the company yeah. and, and how you envisioned it. Yeah. Um, when I looked at the webpage, I mean, your mission statement 
was not like other utility company mission statements. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not yeah. saying it was real touchy-feely, but generally you don't see people saying our company is, is, wants to do good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, that's not your entire mission statement, yeah. but it's a really cool part of yeah, it. Yeah, it is. And so, I, so I, in in one of the you know challenges that I think m most of us face in doing that is is getting the whole company together mm -hmm. to realize that transition is good and change mm -hmm. is okay, mm -hmm. and you actually have to change yeah. in order to look at what your customer needs. Mm -hmm. And one of the fun things I read was, I, I forget how you said it. Let me see if I can find it. Um, you need to actually design a future that gets at what customers want that they can't even articulate yet. Exactly. That it's is so why. cool, <laughs> you know. And, and, yeah. and I, you know, you, you started at a time when there really was a need for ch mm -hmm. transition in the energy world. Yeah. So how did you begin to sort of do that in the in the outside? And once you get the internal okay, yeah. how do you do the outside stuff? I well, mean, I feel like in in some it's so connected you know yeah so I think the change does happen internally but it's with that external focus so that yeah. first again as I said it's it wasn't customer, it wasn't this right? obsession yeah. about us it was obsession about yeah. us in the context of how we were going to be better for Vermont and how we were going to be better for Vermonters and you know I'll never forget as I was transitioning to CEO back on like having it be about doing good for customers it was it was this outgrowth of so our first customer obsession started with like really improving the internal operations and getting way more cost effective shedding millions of dollars of cost and driving up performance, just key performance, you know. And then as I was transitioning to CEO, you know, it, it started with sort of talking about, well, customers have spoken loud and clear. We survey them obsessively. If you're obsessed, you're getting input all the time. And the vast majority of Vermonters wanted a cleaner, greener yeah. energy future. Yeah. But they also wanted to be cost effective, right? And so that was, that's yeah. how we were like, okay, that's, and it was at a time back in 2008 where most people had just accepted the soundbite that it was going to be green and high cost or dirty and cheap, right? <laughs> and so, so we were like, nah, we're rejecting that. Like, we're rejecting that. So guess what? We've got to get smarter, better, more innovative. And then that leads to the next thing you know, you're like leapfrogging past and you're coming up with things that, again, yeah, you're, our customers never said, geez, we'd really like you to come up with a way for us to store energy, help you lower carbon and costs during peaks, <laughs> and never have an outage, right? But because we were obsessed and we were doing these things, the minute we heard that, this, that, that Tesla, we caught wind, back channel, that they were working yeah. on this home storage technology, we naturally said, we want to be there. We want to be part of it. Um, and so now we have thousands of Vermont homes on this technology, many more. So again, that's an example of sort of going after the, the sort of the why we exist and the sort of the, the, the why behind what customers are telling you they want and kind of inventing and leapfrogging past and coming up with innovations that they weren't sitting home and saying, oh geez, I want my smartphone to do this, but all of a sudden when the phone can do this, we love it. So that's, it's the same kind of thinking that we've built into the DNA of the organization. You did so many things there that go well beyond what you talked about. But one of the, you know, one of the challenges I know that we have because you were in what essentially is a political situation, yeah. where you had to deal with really backwards governors like Governor Shumlin and others who really wanted to hold the you worst. back. The worst. I mean, yeah. Tell you, I mean, listen, just, just produce <laughs> that electricity with whatever you can get. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit, which of course is, is a joke, because Governor Shumlin's here and he was, <laughs> I'm sure, uh, encouraging you to not think of yourself as a power you producer must, yeah. as much as, yeah. you know, you, you uh, yeah, key, look at yeah. being an energy yeah. provider, yeah. but also just an energy yeah. efficiency provider. Yeah. Yeah. And part of your, your mission sort of proved to be, how do I help customers get off the grid? Yeah. Now that's interesting. Yeah. Most people would go, okay, how right. does this work? So how does it work? I mean, did you need that kind of leadership at the at the governor's level to to be helpful? Was it was it just a general tenor in Vermont? I mean, are they just drinking something funny no. that they love all this stuff no. or This I mean, was Vermont business, is, right? Yeah, absolutely. So so you're right. The job is inherently I mean, we are a fully regulated, intensely yeah, regulated. Right monopoly utility serving 75% of Vermont, 
You're right. So, so you know, and because of that, um, obviously there is naturally all around the country uh, heavy political influence, yeah. right, in in the work. And actually, for me, it's so funny because, especially on tough days, um, you know. I always go back to that North Star, like, uh, and again, that North Star of like, we are here for Vermonters. We are essentially, you, you know, providing a critical service and a transformation that Vermonters are telling us we want. And so at the end of the day, the most important capital, you, if you will, political capital or other capital, regulatory, comes from the fact that our customers seem to love us. So, so that, that is super helpful. Yes, when you have leaders that are ambitious and want to see dramatic change, I think we got some of the most um, innovative, sweeping, and uh, transformational yeah. legislation done during Governor Shumlin's time in office, right? With this renewable energy statute that actually said we want utilities, not just Green Mountain Power, there are a lot of others in Vermont, we want utilities to be helping customers transition to a lower carbon, lower cost uh, future. And Vermont, our challenge with carbon is not the energy, the electric energy portfolio anymore. It yeah. is, it's cars and it's home heating, principally. Yeah. So it was very, um, uh, you know, I think very, and a very innovative policy approach. Yeah, you um, tackled the home heating right, issue quicker exactly, than anybody to really that go I ever after saw. that. Yeah, they, to you really did. go after that yeah. piece and really look at yeah. how can we help Vermonters uh, decarbonize. Yeah. Um, but you know, in the content, in the time you know I've been in this role, at the time I've been at the company, I've been at the company 21 years, so it's been under a number of governors and administrations. And at the end of the day, as I said, you know. Uh, really obsessing on the customers and on what Vermonters want creates the most powerful box, if you will, that others end up being in, right? Because it's, it's hard if, if, the, if, the, if Vermonters want the kinds of things that we're doing to say that the company shouldn't be doing them, in my view. You know, one of the, the, the things that, that um, I picked up was that you talk about your mission as embracing a new energy system that can improve lives, reduce cost, be produced in a more environmentally and economically sustainable way, so that you're actively moving away from the traditional grid. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, I think uh, this is not unique to Vermont to have customers that actually want this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> it, it, but yeah. you were able to produce it. And, and you, uh, you've gone a little bit further than that, because I really want to talk about your move to, a B Cor to become the mm -hmm. first utility to be mm -hmm. a B Corp company. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Why you did it and what it means? It's, because it's, it really encapsulates everything about a culture of health. Absolutely. That we want that's what businesses I was thinking actually embrace. with the introduction. That's what I was thinking. I mean that's to me that epitomizes uh, organizations that are committed to a culture of health um, being a benefit corporation. And again culture eats strategy. We didn't sit at Green Mountain Power one day and have this, develop this big strategy for how we're gonna become a benefit corporation. What happened, Gina, is we became a benefit corporation. <laughs> we, we became one, right? By the time we actually uh, talked to them and approached them, and again, it was so exciting for me because Ben and Jerry were there to, to celebrate with us when we actually became a benefit corporation. Um, you know, field, yes. in case people <laughs> don't get it. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so, but the, the really cool thing is by the time we went through that process, um, we already scored pretty high because we, yeah. had, we had become one. We had become a value-based organization. So that really became a very natural and wonderful transition. And, you know, that's something that I, you know, it's one of the shining lights of optimism, I think, out there. I think really, you know, how do we turn... Um, you know, our capitalist economy, yep. right, yep. as a force for dramatic and good change. And as, as Ben and Jerry always said, it's about doing well by doing good. And that's really, in essence, what being a benefit corp is. It's, it's yeah. not about that you don't do well. Hopefully you do, because it's about doing good. But it's about it, doing but good it's for society. it's all about being good to your employees. Yeah. It's all yeah. about being good 
to the environment. It's yeah. all about being good to your communities, being mm -hmm. good to your customers. And, and frankly, it's all about doing that to the benefit of the company itself. Absolutely. And so, Mary, during your tenure, which began in 2008, uh, your company grew from serving 88,000 customers to over 260,000 in 2018, with revenues of more than 640 million and two billion in assets. Mm -hmm. So explain to me why every utility CEO can't be you, <laughs> please. <laughs> Just think well, about I mean, this. Again, it would be yeah. an amazing thing. It, yeah, it is an amazing thing because it's been, you know, and again, that, you know, one of the biggest ways that transformation happened really were two major things. One was uh, making the decision to build. Vermont's largest wind farm, yeah, okay, which was uh, a really cost-effective way to get Vermonters clean energy as we launched this vision to which dramatically ramp up. Which is not easy up. to do, I imagine. No, no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, not even in Vermont. It's <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, and I understand that. Actually, I mean, going back to who we are as a customer-obsessed organization, I mean, I'll never forget, I went to the town of Lowell where, we're, where we were proposing to build it, and I had an open town meeting. I mean, there were a lot of people there for a small, uh, community in the Northeast Kingdom, and I told so folks, you don't we send will somebody not there. You actually God, go no, yourself. No, huh? I go myself. Yeah, and I actually told them. I said, and we actually asked them to vote on the project. We asked for a vote before we did it because I said, at the end of the day, we don't want to do this project if the majority of you do not want this project. You know, and you know what what kept me going on those tough, tough days where, you know, again, yeah. people don't, change is hard, change is hard, even when it's to do things that you feel are really good for the people you serve, change can be hard. And what kept me going was that town, I mean, they voted 70, I think the first vote was like 76% in favor. They did a vote, I thought this was actually really funny. They did a vote after it was built. So I'm like, okay, well, the vote before it was built was probably more was probably more important. But I think it was like what a if symbolic it had gone the other way. way. Exactly, and actually, it went higher. You know, the support went higher because we had actually worked really intensely. We we talk a lot about everything is a thousand conversations in Vermont. So anything yeah. important that you need to yeah. do, you need to be having at least a thousand. And when you've done a thousand, maybe it's a thousand more. So yeah, it's a very intimate personal approach we take. Yeah. And but that and and then the other big thing was uh, the the acquisition of the largest utility in yeah. Vermont. Um, that that wasn't focused it's certainly not on the green agenda that Green Mountain Power was feeling that Vermonters were demanding and wanting to do. And back to cost, we saw it as an awesome opportunity to deliver a lower cost trajectory. When we acquired that company, their trajectory showed they were going to need about a 5% rate increase for year after year after year. And we were able, and that's, that's where it also really did yeah. help that Governor Shumlin at that time also saw the incredible value to Vermonters yeah. from a cost perspective. And so yeah. we were able, as we were, trans, as we were going to this greener agenda, we were able to have years where we actually provided bill decreases and cost decreases for Vermonters. And um, over the 20 years yeah. I've been there, you know, the overall has been below the rate of inflation as we've gone to a greener future. So it's, it takes a lot of things, Gina, that yeah. then total up to the kind of numbers you're talking yeah. about. But it's all about providing, using energy as a force for good. Yeah, and, and Mary, you've done, e even, re even recently, um, uh, over the past few months, you've talked about setting goals uh, for, mm -hmm. for the company in terms of uh, getting carbon free and, mm -hmm. and uh, basically go shifting to all renewable energy by 2030, mm -hmm. which is, is pretty important, especially since, as you talked about, you are a bigger company now with yeah. different sets of assets. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's exciting for me is that, you know, in the world we live in, we have to address the issue of climate change. And, and, and it doesn't generally get incorporated into the mission statement of the utility world to make that type of mm -hmm. transition and to recognize the need to do it and to do it in a way which is, you know, profitable and progress enough mm -hmm. that it doesn't r impact reliability at all, um, but, but improves it. So, so uh, Miri, tell me about some of the things you've been recently doing, because uh, the, 
the this sort of coordination between the government in, in Vermont and the people really embracing this challenge, because a lot of the New England states do. We love yeah. our natural resources, yeah. Yeah. and we want, we want to figure out how to protect our kids mm -hmm. and the health mm -hmm. of our kids. So what, you've been very active over the past, I don't know, three or four weeks with uh, the youth climate strike mm -hmm. and with some, some mm -hmm. work you, you did in, in New York during mm -hmm. Climate Week. So mm -hmm. do you want to tell folks about sure. some of the ways in which you and your yeah. company were actively yeah, thinking Yeah, so again, we through? do, we, you know, the planet's on fire, Gina. I mean, that, yeah. you know, and, and we've been talking about that for years at Green Mountain Power. Um, you know, and that is, again, we're obsessed with Vermonters and delivering what Vermonters want. We also are in one of those industries that we are on the front lines of climate change. Yeah. I mean, we are on the front lines. We see the devastating impacts, you know, in, in the context the of more frequent. That, yeah, that I mean, we happened. have had, you know, like one after another of once in 100 years, once in mm -hmm. 200 years. And so we embraced, you know, our first embodiment of it was yes, dramatically ramp up renewable resources, move to lower carbon. We're 90% carbon free now. We launched, we're going to be 100% carbon free by 2025, 100% renewable by 2030. Because also our carbon problem in Vermont is cars and home heating. Yeah. So we need to have a backbone of yeah. as green a grid as possible so yeah. that as we electrify, as the New York Times said, the only solution to climate change is electrify everything. So that's, you know, so yeah. as we don't as want to clean, electri as we, clean right, the energy. It, yeah. Right, exactly. And we've also embraced moving to what we call a home business and community-based energy system. So again, you know, Grandpa's Grid <laughs> is not built for resilience. It's not built yeah. for the kind of dramatic challenges that climate change has, has created. So part of making the grid more resilient for Vermonters, part of preparing them for that next horrific event is to have more homes and businesses be energy independent and be sustainable. And the really yeah. cool thing is we see a really cool role where we become the symphony conductor with others, not to the exclusion yeah. of, yeah. we also see market aggregators doing that as well, but we become the symphony orchestra, orchestra conductor of this orchestra of devices so that we're also then running the whole grandpa's grid much more efficiently. Yeah. So we're driving cost and carbon Hence out also of the leveraging these resources. But the coordination but it also, on storage with yeah. solar. I mean, there's right. so many But back ways. to your point on culture. I mean, the other thing is we have, you know, a carbon countdown. So we took very yeah. seriously the report that came out of, that said we basically have 12 years. I hear now it looks more like eight or nine, but we basically started a countdown that we publish every month that shows what we're all doing internally um, and we challenge each other around our own carbon uh, footprint. So it's really created a culture around uh, this challenge that is fostering innovation and then fostering things like climate week activities where you're right. Really we were fun all stuff. over the we yeah. were all over the state and yes, uh, you know, our, our pension committee that's made up of employees and union workers you know, found a path and wanted to divest the, the fund. And so that's, to your point, that's what, you know, part of what I was able to then announce on behalf of the company at, uh, at Climate Week. So all of that ties to that culture of caring about customers, caring about communities, caring about the environment. But uh, I, I sort of was, was kidding Mary when I saw that you were planning on um, retiring from um, the company. Um, that that the, she got a quote from Bill McKibben, uh, I, praising a utility CEO. <laughs> if anybody knows Bill McKibben, I mean, he's never said anything good about me. I'm really <laughs> ticked off that he said something good about you. I love Bill. He's great. He's you know the co-founder of 350.org. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I just thought it was so great. But then I'm reading the announcement, right? And I can see why he did it. You, you talked about this. It says, uh, this is an important step. This is announcing the divestment of pension funds from fossil fuels for a utility CEO making this announcement, right? And it says, this is an important step we can take to make sure the dollars invested in our union and non-union employees are not only invested wisely, but in a way that is good for the planet and addresses the climate crisis. Miri, 
That's why I call you an enigma. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you need to be cloned. I've been called a lot of things. Yeah, I know. Christina, I not know. always it's, an enigma. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but I, I just thought it was amazing uh, the way you make linkages between all these things because it, uh, most of us think, okay, I got to be good to my employees, and you put it in that category, mm -hmm. and then you deal with climate change, and oh well, renewable energy ought yeah. to do it, and then I'm reading stuff that you're doing to encourage sort of new uh, EV purchases and mm -hmm. all these new incentives you're laying out before the youth climate um, strike yeah. and how engaged you are in that and how you did, you know, basically competition to, for, for new trees that were going to be planted. Yeah. What, what do you eat for breakfast in the morning? <laughs> Man, it's just amazing. I've always had an intense amount of energy and drive, Gina. So, I've, and I've always said, you know, so it's funny. I have not used the word retiring, as you know, because I, I know did, I that, didn't know what to that say. That probably like Leaving. horrifies my husband. At that, at that yeah, thought. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and me too, because I, I feel like I've always, like this energy is like this heat-seeking missile. So it's really important that it's pointed towards something positive that I yeah. can get done. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, you know, and I've just always, from as far back is as your I husband out scouring the want <laughs> exactly. ads now. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's you know, and for me, I think that's why I said I feel like, you know, there are days. I mean, I, I'm as I'm human, right? The <laughs> next like there are days that you have to kind of just say lights, camera, action. Like, let's go. Like, we're gonna go. We're gonna do because I I feel like there. I've never felt like there's a lot of time. I mean, maybe that's one thing that also has helped. I've never, I don't know, as from early as, as I can recall, I've just had this sense of urgency. Um, and so to fix things, you know, and it's kind of changed over the years what I wanted to fix. Um, but, uh, you know, in the context of this work we're doing around energy and around the kind of transformation and how we ultimately can help be part of, like, improving lives of Vermonters because again these solutions that we're working tirelessly on are going to help them have more affordable like more resilient happier peaceful existence you know what I mean so it's so yeah so that cause gives me a lot of energy you know I and I so. and I believe it you know I go to these things myself I go with my EV like and I'll I'll also give rides with customers like that's our other thing is like we don't believe in like letting it, like, it, we believe in a very gritty approach. We believe in, like, on the ground, grassroots transformation. And we believe our job is to accelerate a consumer-led revolution to newer technologies. Yeah. I think that's the only thing that actually works in a democracy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or you don't have one anymore. Right, right. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and I think that's the challenge is, to move from these one size fits all or I've got a big new innovation mm -hmm. thinking that's all you need to do instead right. of do the work that you've we've always yeah. had to do to make progress. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's why as you again, roll up your sleeves, right. you work with every other human being you know, yeah. you talk about it at the yep. community level, you get people engaged yep. and you've just used that approach to yeah. transform and we the have way also that anybody as well everybody as with the market solutions. It. I mean, we provided yeah. like some of the highest incentives in the country for storage. So again, it's not it's about it's a, it's a problem of abundance. <laughs> so, you know, the problem is an abundant problem and the opportunity is huge for, tr for transformation. So we've also, you know, I believe fully like utilities need to be on the front line, market solutions need to be on the front line, and we need to all be working together and get away from this, this or that. So some of, some of the states that worry me actually are where they've complexified it and they've created yeah. so many silos yeah. and, well, innovation belongs to this sector and this belongs to this sector. You know what? No time for that. We got to have an all-in, all-hands-on-deck, solution-oriented approach yeah. for, for, you know, for the people we serve. Well, Mary, your, your energy is going to be great out there uh, doing many different things because I think one of the biggest challenges we face now is people in their anxiety to change things quickly. Um, they are becoming, you know, more and more anxious and, and in many ways they're mm -hmm. losing their, their hope that yeah. change can happen, yeah. especially young people. Mm -hmm. I love the activity. Yeah. I think that they're doing great. I just want them to understand that change can happen, yeah. that, that you totally provide a you, real can, life example of this. You've got to have hope. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, action without hope you know, to me is, is just not as powerful. Like it's got to be, we've got to, we've got to 
all work towards solutions. Yeah. Mary, if there's one thread in, in your life and, 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 and how you live it, um, it is your love for people, but it's also your sense of passion and mission. Mm -hmm. You don't just love them, <laughs> you, you want to help. Yeah. And I think that's reflected in everything that you have ever done. Yeah, and I you. think your success at, at showing the way at Green Mountain Power has been sort of a, a way that gives all of us hope that there are people like you who can transform the way we think and act mm -hmm. for the benefit of all of us, including mm -hmm. our planet. So thank you for everything you're doing. In the end, it is all about people. It's all about our health. It's all about our working together. It's and all connected. It it's is. all connected. So yep. I thank you. And yeah. Congratulations. And thanks for being here and sharing your story with everybody. Thank you, Gina. It's always a pleasure to yeah, talk to you. You're awesome. Oh, thank you. You're awesome. Thank you. Thanks.